profited tonight. Psalm 62 and verse number 1, uh, the psalmist says under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, Truly my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you imagine mischief against a man? He shall be slain, all of you. As a bowing wall shall he be, and as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Selah. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Surely men of low degree are vanity and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Trust not in oppression and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. If you're in the habit of marking your Bible, I sure hope that you are. In verse number one, you find this phrase, my salvation. In verse number two, you find the phrase, my salvation. In verse number six, you find these words in succession, he is my salvation. In verse number seven, in God is my salvation. For a few moments tonight, I want to preach on this thought. My salvation is in God. My salvation is in God. Now, when we think about salvation, obviously our minds, first of all, go to our eternal salvation, correct? Our, our, our being saved from our sins. But the truth of the matter is, let's just be honest, God does far more salvation in our lives than just that. The word salvation is just a general word. It means deliverance. You may save somebody's life. All right? And that's just a general word of, of, of salvation. God saves us in many, many ways. Let me give you some thoughts about Psalm 62 by way of introduction. Interesting, Psalm 62, there's no petitions made. Uh, just a declaration from David of what he believed to be true about God. The psalmist David does not say that God has my salvation. He says God is my salvation. I want you to consider the gospel of John chapter 17. In verse number 1, the word of God says, These words spake Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And listen to verse 3 of John 17. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast Sent. You know what eternal life is? It's the eternal one inside of us. Amen? It's the eternal one inside of us. It's not just that God gives us uh, eternal life. It's actually Him in us. Christ in us, the Bible says. The hope of glory. The Bible says that He is our life. He is in us. And everything that we have, we, without Him, we don't have anything. That's what the Bible says. Amen. All of our blessings have no meaning apart from Him. Our salvation is in God. Acts chapter 4, verse number 12. Of course, we're familiar with this verse. The Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Salvation is in Christ and in Christ alone. As we go to Psalm 62 here tonight, I want you to see that uh, many believe the setting to be when Absalom was rebelling against David. The people were divided. David had lost influence because Absalom had undermined him to 
the people. So much so that David had to flee Jerusalem. Had to leave the throne for fear of his own life. Of course, we understand David had sinned. He had gotten right with God. Yes, praise God for that. We love Psalm 51, did we not? That repented psalm of David. But the truth of the matter is the consequences still go on, don't they? The consequences still live on. I was speaking to someone this week and I said, hey, I said, if you uh, were, uh, if someone were to kill somebody and God, and they asked God to forgive them, would God forgive them? Uh, right away, amen. But they're probably still going to have to go to prison, aren't they? And pay the consequences for their sin. David's sin still had lasting consequences long after the forgiveness of God. David's sin, as we talked about a couple weeks ago in Psalm 61, we know that one of David's sons took advantage of his uh, sister sexually. We know that one of David's sons killed the, that son for what he did to his sister, which of course is David's daughter. And the rebellion begins to spread. And what David needed was he needed God to be his salvation. John chapter number 10, if you consider these verses tonight, in verse 27, the Bible says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Aren't you glad that when we're saved, we're in the Lord's hands? Amen. David declares that God is the only place. That's what he's saying here in Psalm 62, that God is his only place. Of absolute safety. It has been said of this psalm that it is, uh, this psalm has been called the God only psalm. Think about that. The God only psalm. In other words, you don't have anybody else but God. And by the way, God is working on our lives to bring us to Himself to where our dependency is totally on the Lord. Amen? Our dependency is totally on Him, our sufficiency is in Him. Alexander McLaren, the great Bible teacher of yesteryear, this was his favorite psalm. And I'll give you this, and I, as I thought about what he said, I thought about, oh, how convicting some of the old-time preachers were. McLaren said this. He said of Psalm 62, he said, quote, it is too high for most Christians when it speaks of God only. Too high for most Christians when it speaks of God only. Meaning that most Christians want God and. We want God, but we want a security blanket in plan B or C. McLaren said this psalm is too high for most Christians when it speaks of God only. Again, when we think of salvation, we think about being saved from our sins. But the truth of the matter is that's only the beginning of salvation, isn't it? We have been saved from the penalty of sin. We're being saved uh, from the power of sin. Praise God. One day we will be saved from the very presence of sin. Amen. Amen. But the Christian life is an unending discovery of God, is it not? You'll never get to the bottom of Him. You'll never understand Him completely. It is an unending discovery of God. And we need to see His Christ and Christ alone. Psalm 62 can be divided, and we'll divide it this evening uh, in pretty easy ways. Verses 1 through 4 is a grouping of verses. And then you find the word Selah. What does that mean? Think about it. Just pause and think about it. You know what uh, God could have done? I thought about this today. God could have put Selah after every verse. And that would have been good. Amen? I think we've spent, sometimes we spend far too much time reading God's word and not near enough time thinking about God's word. Meditating on it. Chewing on it. But verses 1 through 4, if you see the end of verse 4, you find the word Selah. The end of verse 8, you find the word Selah. So 5 through 8 is a grouping. And then verses 9 through 12 will be the last grouping tonight. So let's look at these verses here this evening. First of all, from verses 1 through 4, I want us to consider David's delay. David's delay. David faced many enemies, as we know from the scriptures. Of course, the greatest heartache that David had was where? In his own home. In his own family. In 2 Samuel chapter 18, where we 
we have read, we've alluded to a couple of different times in our study of Psalms where David uh, cries because of the death of his son Absalom. And I said a couple of weeks ago in that psalm that where David cries and mourns and weeps over his son, where he says, my son, my son Absalom, that somebody said he could have easily replaced the word son with the word sin. My sin, my sin Absalom, because it was his sin. It was his sin that was the reason that his family was the way that it was. David had heartache at home. He had people around him speaking of overthrowing him as king. And David had no place to go. Where could he go? I'll tell you where he could go. Hallelujah. He could go to the Lord. And aren't you glad we can always go to the Lord? No matter if we don't have anywhere else to go, we can always go to the Lord. I want you to look at verse number one. It says here, truly my soul waiteth upon God. That's why I called it David's delay. Truly my soul waiteth upon God. Verse five, he says the same thing. My soul wait thou only upon God. Certainly in your minds, probably you may have already thought of this. A great corresponding verse to that verse is Isaiah 40 in verse 31. Where the Bible says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Can I tell you that there are two ways to live the Christian life? By force or by faith? By force, having your own way, or by faith, letting God have his way. You know what David said? Again, let's remind ourselves, David's, David's a warrior. He knows what it's like to take care of business, doesn't he? Amen? But you know what he said here in verse number one? I'm going to wait on God and let God handle this. I'm going to wait on God and let God handle this. Truly, my soul, verse number one, waiteth upon God. David says, I am going to wait on God. Can I give you this thought this evening? Many times the more intense the conflict, the more tempted we become to take matters in our own hands. You know, when everything's going well and everything's easy, you know what we say? Well, let's just trust the Lord. You know why? Because in our minds, we think we really don't have a whole lot to trust God for. Things are going pretty well. But isn't it amazing when things get into crunch time, how we go back to leaning on our own understanding and trusting ourselves. It's amazing the more the conflict, we take matters, we're tempted to take matters in our own hands. God is working here on David to bring him to a place that all that he has is God. And by the way, God will do that for us. Notice I didn't say God will do that to us. I said God will do that for us. God will do that for us as well. When nothing else will work except we must trust the Lord. And by the way, that process is never ending. Of trusting the Lord. It's a daily thing. Paul said, I die daily. It's a daily struggle of yielding our flesh and surrendering to God. It's a never ending process. Tomorrow our flesh will want to rise up and we'll need to crucify it. And on Friday our flesh will rise up and we'll need to crucify it. And Saturday, if the Lord has to come back, and Sunday, and on and on it goes. David here in Psalm 62 is at his wit's end. By the way, that's a good Bible word, but with wit's end. He is reduced to nothing. But God, in, and, and he said, this is where God wanted to bring me. Look at verse number one. He says, truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only, notice that word only. He only is my rock in my salvation. You know how you can say he only is your rock in salvation? When you don't have anything else to turn to. There's no plan B here. There's no, there's no, there's nothing else he can turn to. He says, he is my defense. Verse two, I shall not be greatly moved. A good question for us to consider tonight is, who do we look to for deliverance? So many people, I'm talking about Christian people who call themselves saved and Christians and love the Lord. So many of us take matters in their own hands. 
You know what the Lord will do many times? He'll strip all that away. He'll strip away all the other abilities until we come to the place where we totally depend upon the Lord. And it's God only. Look at verse number three. In verse number three, he says, how long? He's speaking of his enemies. How long will he imagine mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain, all of you. And I believe, and, and I'm not going to argue with you if you don't agree with my interpretation of verse number three. I believe the end of verse three, he's actually speaking of what his enemies say about him. It says, as a bowing wall shall he be, and as a tottering fence. The reason I believe that is because when you look at verse number four, they talk about casting him down. So what I believe in verse number three is, the enemies are saying, hey, listen, we keep going after him. 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 And as we keep going after him, he's like that tottering fence. He's about to fall. He's about to cave. He's, a, he's about to, uh, to be done in. He's about to be finished. Just a little more push. Just a little bit more. And he will be finished. How many times have we been like that? But aren't you glad, as David said here tonight, he's standing on a rock. Amen? Amen for that. In verse number two. Many times we are like that, but praise God, we are on, our, on a rock, and his name is Jesus Christ. But friend, I want to remind us that if we are not anchored on him, we will fall. Verse number four, if you look at it there, notice they just keep piling on. He says, they only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Notice that. Notice the example here. And, and, uh, and, and he said, um, he, he seen all of these things. He says, they're, they're mad. They, 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 they're they they're after me, but he turns it over to the Lord. He found his strength in the Lord. Notice verse number four. Again, their method is lies and deceit. David said there are those who pretended to be his friends, but were really his foes. They pretended to be for him, but they were really against him. The truth of the matter is only God can take care of you. In a situation like that. Friend, let me remind you, if you try to pull out the tares with the wheat, you'll make a mess. Leave that in God's hands. So we see David's delay, and I love that there. He says, I'm going to wait on the Lord. Number two, look at verses five through eight, and notice with me David's declaration. You say, preacher, who is this declaration to? Well, according to verse number five, he's talking to himself. We realize tonight we do more talking to ourselves than we do to anybody else. We do. Amen? Amen. You know what David's doing here? He's just giving himself a pep talk. He's talking to himself. Look at verse 5. Notice who he's talking to. My soul. Wait thou only upon God. For my expectation is from him. But wouldn't that be a good pep talk to give yourself every day? Wait on God. Whoa, 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 wait. Is this God's will or is this yours? Wait on God. Make sure this is God. All right, that's what David's doing. He's speaking to himself. And his expectation was in God. Where's our expectation tonight? With everything, with every temptation to take matters in our own hands, we need to do it God's way and not yield to our way. Those who were Followers of the missionaries, C.T. Studd. C.T. Studd was a great missionary of yesteryear. And there was a book written about that, about him, and those who followed his life in ministry were asked, what was the main thing you took from his life? And they said there were many things that they took from his life, but the main thing they learned from him was that C.T. Studd taught them that there were many channels through which God works, but he's the only source. God's the source of everything, isn't it? Many times we expect things from people. 
Yes, God uses people, but our expectation must be, according to verse number five, our expectation is from him. He alone is the one that we need to turn to for help. We want to do battle with others, but if we're not careful, we'll get full of ourselves and think we can do this. We can overcome that. But David realized the only way he could deal with it was to give it to the Lord. And by the way, when you give it to the Lord, you know what God will give you, give you back? Peace. You know why a lot of people don't have peace? Because they have turmoil inside their own soul. There's a wrestling match of trying to take care of it themselves. And look at verse number five. I love this. He says, my soul, wait thou only upon God. Notice this. For my expectation is from him. Boy, there's a peace in that, isn't there? There's a peace knowing that God is going to work. God is going to work in his time. And you just wait on the Lord. You be patient. And God will give you a peace in that time. It doesn't matter all the chaos that could go on around you. God can give you a peace right in your own heart. Knowing that our expectation is of him. God is going to work. God is going to do it in his time. And we're just going to wait on him. And again, I want to remind you, David was a capable man. David was mighty in battle and valor. David was charming. David was talented. David was gifted. I'm sure many times in, in this scenario that's going on in David's life, I wonder, I wonder how many times he thought, I wonder which of all my talents I'm going to use here. He didn't do that, though, did he? He said, no, listen. He, listen and, by, and by the way, God actually brought him to a place where none of those were even available. <coughs> Amen? I, I've said this before. Many times it's not our, our weaknesses that are our greatest problem. It's our strengths. Those need to be yielded to God too. <coughs> because what are we tempted to do? Well, I have a strength in this area. So I'm going to do it in my own strength. No. L listen, David was stripped of all of those things. He said, only one that I could count on is God. Look at verse number six. It says, he only, don't you like that word? He only. Verse number two, he said the same thing, didn't he? He only. Verse number six, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation, verse seven, and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Aren't you glad that we can trust God at all times? Amen to that. We can trust God at all times. When we trust, we'll pour out our heart to him. Praise God for that. God alone is the only one that is completely trustworthy. Those would be thirdly this evening, and that is David's dependence. David's dependence. David's delay in verses 1 through 4. David's declaration in verses 5 through 8. And now verses 9 through 12. David's dependence. Look at verse number 9. Notice how David describes people that are without God. He says, Surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Think about that. And then in verse number 10, David gives great counsel. Notice it. He says, trust not in oppression. And become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. That's a wise counsel, isn't it? You know, some people have thought about that verse, verse number 10, trust not in oppression. Some people have been emp empowered and they abuse that authority over the lives of others that they can oppress. Some run their home by oppression, which can I just say is a pitiful way to operate your home. When love and trustworthiness is available, when seeking the mind of God is, an avail is available, Forcing through oppression is a poor way to operate. Yelling and persisting is a pitiful way for a Christian to live. Look at verses 11 and 12. And I want you to see a truth 
that we need to see in verses 11 and 12. He says, God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Well, we like that, don't we? But look at verse 12. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy. Notice that thought, power and mercy. Power and mercy. Praise God, we can trust in his power, amen. God is all powerful. By the way, trust in his power, not yours. Many try to exercise their power, emotional power, financial power, physical power. No, trust in God's power. But friend, remember that God is not only powerful, God is also merciful. You see, if God had power and no mercy, there wouldn't be Calvary. Amen? But friend, if God had mercy and he felt bad for us, but he had no power, he wouldn't be able to help us. No, friend, God is a God of power and mercy. You see, God's power is always combined with mercy. And people cannot be trusted with power unless it is combined with mercy. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4, if you would please. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Hold your place. We'll come back and finish it up here in just a minute. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'd like for you to see something here. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I'd like to read verses 13 and 14. Paul says, The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee in the books, but especially the parchments, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. You see, if what happened to Paul happened to most people, you know what? They would talk about it the rest of their lives and never get over it. You know what Paul did? The same thing David did. Just put it in God's hands. Amen? Look at verse 14. What, what's Paul do? The Lord's going to take care of this. The Lord reward him according to his works. In verse 14. That's exactly what David did. These situations going on. He says, God, <laughs> it's yours. David gave it to the Lord. You know, some people want power so they can get even. God has power and mercy. As far as those who wish us wrong, God will render to every man according to his works. Look at verse 12. Again, what a thought compared to that, to 2 Timothy 4, 14. Look at verse 12 of our text in Psalm 62. He says, Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his works. God will take care of it. You ever known some people that are all wound up? Never have a minute's peace? They have to have the last word? Always angry about something? You need to give it to the Lord, amen? Mm -hmm. Give it to the Lord. Give it to the Lord. Let me ask you some questions tonight as we close. To think on and chew on them, would you please? Number one, what is in your life that is keeping you from having peace? Another question. What stands between you and you giving that person in that situation to the Lord? Question. Does God have the power to deal with it? Does God have the mercy to deal with it? Amen. We sometimes want God to deal with people in power. Then mercy. God doesn't deal with power, people with power, then mercy. God deals with people with power and mercy. And by the way, if God didn't work that way, the 
church would be empty tonight. You know? Because the Bible says there's not of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. God is consuming fire. Question. Do we have faith to leave our future and the future of all those who have troubled us in the hands of the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-merciful God? See, that's the only way you're going to have peace. I'm going through a Bible study at work. I made a statement not too long ago on our Zoom Bible study. I told our employees that peace is not the absence of problems. Peace is the presence of God. See, it's the only way David could have peace. And aren't you glad we can have peace right in the middle of our storms? Amen. I don't know about you tonight. I want that peace. I hope you want that peace. David said, God is my salvation. He is my impenetrable refuge. He is my safety. No one or no thing can get me in the Lord. Amen. I'm in his hand. Amen. Has God brought you to the place where it is him only? By the way, that's not a bad place. That's a good place when it's just him. Because I can tell you that's a place of peace and contentment in the Lord. God is our salvation. Amen? He's our salvation. Not just eternal, but every day. God is our deliverance. Let's let him have his way. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed this evening. Every head bowed and 